All right, welcome folks. Glad to see everybody here. Well, at least the first half of you. Uh, everybody else will get here shortly. All right, so we're gonna spend some more time today um, talking about energy in general and um, how energy and heat affects things like temperature change. Um, and it's there's going to be today is going to be some practical calculations that we'll we'll learn how to do, um, but it's also going to be sort of a a definition heavy lecture um, where we're going to talk a lot about concepts um, and and how they apply to to the real world, and then we will go from from there and and uh, be able to calculate some of these properties in the future. Um, all right, so some, some random fun questions for, that uh, I was actually surprised I got this first question twice out of out of 50 quizzes. Um, that doesn't have, this is kind of an odd question for, for there to be a duplicate. Um, and basically it's, it's a question that, that has come up before that doesn't really have an answer, it's sort of a speculative question. Basically, will humans ever solve science? Will we ever know everything there is to know about how the universe works? Um, and so because it's speculative, I don't have a, a real answer. I can give you my personal opinion, which is um, that I think that, uh, well, I don't think humans as a species will live long, exist long enough to run out of science to study. Um, if we knew that humans were going to not go extinct, not destroy our own planet, not have some you know species ending catastrophe, um, then it's possible. It seems unlikely because there's so, sort of always gaps in in our knowledge, um, you know, where discrete pieces of knowledge sort of fit together. Right where they fit together, that intersection is where there's a lot always some interesting questions to be asked, and I don't see there being a shortage of those. I don't see that that's a solving science doesn't really seem to be like something that you could actually realistically go um, achieve. Um, but it is interesting to think about if there's a finite amount of things to know about how the universe works or not. Um, somebody else just asked, what's the most common element making up our planet? Depends if you mean the crust or the entire thing. If you're talking about the crust of the planet, it's either oxygen or silicon. If you mean the entire planet as a whole, it's probably iron. Um, and there's some really cool um, graphics and and lists that talk um, where you can find out information about um, relative abundance of elements on Earth. I remember there being a series. I get this question about every year, which is why these pink links show up pink here. Um, But if you can look at the entire solar system, you can look at the entire universe, you can look at Earth as a whole. Um, and there's some some really interesting graphics about it. Yeah, silica is the most common chemical compound, and that's SiO2, which is dirt, basically. Uh, it's sand. Um, aluminum, calcium. Um, but there's, there's a lot of interesting Earth science um, that goes into you know, why does the earth have a certain ratio of these chemical compounds and why is it different than Mars, for instance? Um, looking at the ratio of different chemical compounds in meteorites is one way we can tell where meteorites came from. We can tell certain meteorites were once a part of Mars because we know what Mars is made out of based on the rovers that have been there and based on looking at the color of the light from the sun that bounces off of Mars. Um, and so we can actually use some of those analyses to say, okay, you know, this is why Jupiter is made up primarily of hydrogen. This is why Neptune is primarily made of water. Um, and that kind of gives us a lot of insight into the formation of the solar system and how that whole process happened. Um, and then some, uh, a good question about the, um, the COVID vaccines and the different varieties. Um, so the, the first two, the most common that are that everybody's sort of learned are the, the most common uh, vaccines at this point, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. 
are both um, a new vaccine technology called mRNA vaccines, where you basically, instead of taking a denatured piece of a virus and injecting it into your body to let your immune system get to know it and recognize it as foreign, what mRNA vaccines do is they actually trick your cells into producing a modified version of the viral um, proteins. So you're not actually injecting any proteins into your body. You're having your cells produce the proteins themselves, which allows them to get a more, um, one, it allows it to be a very, very standard procedure to adapt to new variants or other diseases in the future in a way that traditional vaccines um, can't. Um, and the answer is to why is there more mRNA in the Moderna versus the Pfizer? A big chunk of that is we don't know. This is a new technique. Um, and so given that we are more worried about getting people vaccinated against COVID than we are about figuring out how it works right now, it basically is like, well, we proved it worked. Then they did a big study to say, this is the optimum dose for the Moderna version. And this is the optimum dose for the Pfizer version. We don't know exactly why, although it probably has to do with the exact proteins that they're producing in your body and one being easier for your body to recognize as foreign and kind of um, gear up to, to fight against. Um, but yeah, we, there's still a lot of, of fundamental research on how mRNA vaccines work before we're going to know exactly why some of these things are the way they are. Right now, we just know they work. As for why do some vaccines require one dose versus two? That's, that's a, sort of the nature of both the, the virus and the particular um, proteins that your body is recognizing. There's traditional, or traditional viruses that require multiple vaccine shots as well, right? Um, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella that you got when you were young um, required two shots in your first two years and then another booster shot when you were five or something like that. Um, and so part of it is just the nature of the viruses themselves um, kind of dictate how often you have to get a booster or how quickly your, your immune system can, can learn to recognize it. Um, and that's, that's the same reason why we don't have vaccines for every virus out there. You know, there is not a vaccine for HIV. Um, and that a big chunk of that is because the nature of the HIV virus is that it's really, really hard to get your body to recognize it as foreign and, and not allow infection to happen. So um, good questions. I, I always kind of like questions that I have to answer with, well, we don't exactly know yet. Those are kind of fun questions usually. Um, some questions that are relevant to the course as a whole. Um, are combined units always a measured number? And could you ever have a combined unit that's not a measured number? And this is a very good question. Um, and my and I, I always, I hesitate to give absolutes like always or never. Um, so, but I can't think of a combined unit that's not a measured number. Densities are always going to be a measured number. Speeds are always going to be a measured number. Um, I'm trying to think what other combined numbers are there. Heat capacities we're going to deal with today um, are always measured numbers. I can't think of a combined unit that's not a measured number. Um, so that's a good thing to pay attention to when it comes. Percentages are always measured numbers. Um, so that's a good thing to pay attention to when you are looking at your sig figs, right? Um, if you're using one of those combined unit conversions, like a density or speed, it's that's probably a measured number, which means it factors into your sig figs. Um, this is another good question about how, how many times do experiments typically need to be run to determine the most reliable answer? I mean, ideally an infinite number of times, because then you could be sure that if you averaged all of them up, you would get the true answer. Um, we don't actually have that kind of time and ability to do that. Um, and so part of it is, the reason this is a really relevant question is because it has to do with how precise your measurements are and how accurate they are. If you have 
if you have numbers that you're measuring that you're pretty sure are accurate, but they're not very precise, they're all over the place. You need more measurements to be sure that you're actually getting a good representation of what the average is. If your numbers are all really, really close together, if they're very precise, then you don't need to run the trial as many times because you all of your measurements are agreeing with themselves with each other. Um, so it, it really does depend on, and there's a statistical process for determining whether when you've done enough measurements, basically. Um, and that's something that's going to vary from field to field, but it it really does have to do with well, how good is your data? If your data is really good, you don't need many data points. If your data is all over the place, you got to take a lot of data points. Um, should I memorize all the conversions on the sheets to, to better my math? I would say absolutely not. Um, I've got a good memory myself, but I also hate the idea of being told to memorize things. It always bothered me, and I don't want to tell you guys to just memorize things. Um, I'm never going to take away your conversion sheet. right? So there is no reason that you should need to memorize it. I would get used to using the conversion sheet, especially the one that I give you, because you know that that's the one that's going to have everything you need for the final. Um, and I'll, I'll get, get you in a second, Anthony. Um, but I, I would definitely learn to use the conversion sheet I give you rather than spending time memorizing the conversions. Know where you can find everything. Know how the prefixes work based on how they're written on the conversion sheet. Um, but you, you definitely don't need to memorize them. The ones that you use all the time, you're going to wind up memorizing because you're going to use them all the time. Um, and the ones that you don't use all the time, you just know you can always get them from your conversion sheet and roughly where they are. Um, and last but not least, will you get marked off for not putting units on your final answer? Also, absolutely, uh, is your answer here. Always, if you write a number, it needs to have a unit or it needs to have some sort of context. If you solve for something like a percentage that doesn't have a unit on it, then you need to give me some context what that number is. Even if you're showing all your work before that, whatever you put in a box um, as your final answer should have units or some context as to what that number is. Um, so for instance, we'll do some, some, cal or some uh, calculations in the future where we find um, a concentration that's um, called mole fraction, which is basically like the, the amount of atoms um, of a specific element. Um, and it doesn't wind up having any units to it because it's kind of like a percentage, it's sort of a ratio. But if we wanted to say what, if we wanted to write that as your final answer, if I want to say the mole fraction of say silicon, so this symbol is a, a Greek letter chi, um, it means it's the uh, variable that means mole fraction. If I solve for mole fraction of silicon, I might get a number that was, you know, uh, let's say 0 0.34 that doesn't have any units on it. So in this case, writing out something like this ahead of time is what is basically is your units. It's what gives this number context. So if your final answer doesn't have any units on it, you still have to give me context somehow, right? Same for something like a, you know, a percent by mass. If you solve for 32%, that under the context, I might not mark you down if you just left it like that, depending on how the question was written. But if you were dealing with multiple, multiple percentages, um, it's never a bad idea to give you more context, give yourself more context and write it as 32% percent, percent, I don't know, percent bone by mass. Right, those aren't technically units, but it's giving this number context and meaning. You never want to write a number without some sort of context, whether it's a unit or whether it's a description. Uh, Chase, the, we'll get into mole fraction. A mole is basically how many of an atom you have. It's a counting number. Mole fraction is, is kind of like what percentage of all of the atoms are a specific type of atom. Um, 
And thank you, Stephanie and Amber for Anthony answering Anthony's questions. Um, and you, yes, Dana, you can absolutely redo the virtual labs to get your better score. It just keeps your highest score. Um, <clears throat> any other course course structure questions? All right. I think everybody's settling into how the how this class works, right? Everybody's sort of getting a routine, a weekly routine going. All right. So just since all the most common question that I got after last week's quiz was, uh, I still don't know what I'm doing with conversions. Can we still can we do more practice conversions? Let's do some practice conversions, not tricky ones. Get a handle on the basic conversions here. And I'm going to give you guys five minutes to work on these. Uh, and then we'll go through the answers. Probably helps if I share screen, huh?
All right, I thought about doing these all on the on the board here, but it probably makes more sense um, to do this on the board so you guys can watch um, and uh, follow the logic here. Thank you, Ali, for letting me know. Um, I actually knew that I was talking to my wife, who's also in the room at the same time. So if you see me muted when you guys are working on example problems, um, talking to myself, that's probably what's happening. Um, still always good to remind me because sometimes I do forget to unmute. All right, so let's look at um, this. Uh, let's look at meters to inches. And we'll go to the whiteboard here. All right, so if we're trying to go from 2.055 meters to inches, we know we want to start by canceling out meters, right? So meters is the unit we're starting from. We need to cancel out meters. So we need a conversion that involves meters. And we need to move in the direction that's going to get us closer to it inches. So if we remember that the that if we're trying to go from metric units to, to British units, we almost always are going to have to go through that centimeters to inches conversion. So if we take our meters and go to centimeters, centimeters to inches, all right? So we're gonna to need to cancel out meters. So, and we wanna to get to centimeters. So one meter is 10 to the two centimeters or a hundred, 10 to the two and a hundred are the same thing. And then you can say, okay, for every 2.54 centimeters is one inch. Right, and so we always remember we always need to set it up so that whatever units on top is being canceled out, but the same unit on bottom. Right, that's the big. It's not really a trick. That's how conversions work. Is we want to cancel out the units by having them on opposite sides of the fraction line. So we'll get something around what, like 70 inches? No, that's too high. No, that's about right. Eighty. Eighty point nine. We have four sig figs here. These were both exact conversions. So we're going to keep four sig figs, Uh, gallons to liters, there's a couple different routes you can go, depending on what conversions you have in front of you. Um, I don't have the approximate conversion memorized. So I'm going to go the exact conversion route where I go gallons to inches, inches to centimeters, or sorry, gallons to cubic inches, cubic inches to cubic centimeters, cubic centimeters to liters, because I know all those conversions off the top of my head. If you have your conversion sheet, sheet sitting in front of you, um, you might go gallons to quarts and quarts to liters. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't know that I know gallons and or liters and quarts are close to the same, but I don't know that conversion off the top of my head. So I'm just going to go the long route and give us some practice with the cubic conversions as well. So if I have 2.8 gallons, we only really have a couple of conversions that have gallons in them. One of which is our official definition of gallon, which is one gallon equals 231 cubic inches. So if you start there,
now we're in cubic inches. And if we're trying to go from British to metric, it's never a bad thought to say, hey, can I go through that exact conversion to 0.54 centimeters inches? So in this case, we've got inches cubed on top. That means we can also use, we can use our inches to centimeters. We're just gonna have to do it three times. We need to cancel out all three powers of inches. So one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And we do that three times. Which means we're gonna have to cube everything in here. One gets cubed, but it doesn't change. Inches gets cubed, so it can cancel out inches cubed. Centimeters cubed is our new unit. And 2.54 gets cubed. So we're going to multiply by 2.54 cubed is the net result of this conversion. I didn't leave myself much room here, but once we get there, cubic centimeters is the same as a milliliter. So we can say 10 to the 3 or a thousand cubic centimeters is one liter. Right, and our gallons to cubic inches conversion doesn't need to be cubed because inches cubed is already part of the conversion. And our cubic centimeters to liters doesn't need to be cubed because cubic centimeters is already part of the conversion. So we only needed to cube this conversion in the middle. which, so this should give us something close to 12 liters. It's about four liters in a gallon, roughly. At 10.599, we're only going to keep two sig figs. So 11 liters. There was something about this that I was going to say. Oh. Um, if you use the other route using the non-exact conversions, um, you might be off by one in this last sig fig, right? You might come up with 10, or if you rounded every step of the way, you might come up with a different number. You might come up with 10 instead of 11. That's to be expected. That's normal. And both of those answers would be considered right because there's uncertainty in the last digit that we write down here. Right, because there's uncertainty in the ones place. So as you guys are still getting used to, to how this class works, that's the most common question I get is right now is my number looks a little different than yours. Um, do I still get full credit? Or I got a different answer than you because they got they got uh, 10.45 instead of 10.55, so they rounded down instead of up. Those are the same numbers as far as I'm concerned, right? As long as it's within sig figs, as long as it's within plus or minus one in the last sig fig we write, that is the same number to me, right? So don't panic just because your calculator answer doesn't look like my calcul calculator answer. All right, last but not least, we've got one that's combined units. Um, this is the speed of sound, 340 at sea level, 343.28 meters per second. If we want to put that into miles per hour, the really rough way of, of doing that conversion, if you're just trying to do it in your head and you just need a really rough answer, is that. Um, Miles per hour is always about double meters per second. So it should give us something in the realm of around 700 miles per hour when we do this conversion. 
But if we want more sig figs, we got to show our work and do the math on the calculator. All right, so 767.90 miles per hour. So that is relatively close to what, uh, what we were thinking. So that's probably right. As far as taking a combined unit and converting it, um, I'm gonna break it up into two conversions this time to show you a different way of thinking about this. If the way we've been doing it, where you start with meters on top and seconds on bottom and you cross them out works all as one step, that's fine, go for that. But for those of you that that's still tricky, here's another way to think about it. If we're saying 343.28 meters in one second, you can take 343.28 meters and convert that into miles. And at the same time, that was meters for every one second, right? So you could also just as well say, okay, that's in one second and take one second and convert that into hours. And you'll get a distance in miles and you'll get a time in hours and you can take the miles and divide by hours and you should get that 767 number, right? So this is another way of thinking about those combined units when we're trying to use them as a conversion or sorry, when we're trying to convert combined units. All right, so for this first one, meters to miles, 343.28 meters. You can either go meters to kilometers, kilometers to miles, um, although you're limited by the conversion on the conversion sheet, which is only four sig figs then. So it makes more sense to go the long route to get all, all exact conversions in this case. So meters to centimeters, centimeters to inches, inches to feet, feet to miles. It's a couple extra steps rather than going to kilometers and going straight to miles that way. But remember that that conversion on the conversion sheets, 1.0, well, sorry, it's 1.609 kilometers equals one mile, right? That's only four significant figures. We're starting with five sig figs here. We don't want to have to round off one of our sig figs just because we were lazy and used the short conversion. Whenever we can, we want to keep all the sig figs we started with by using exact conversions. Right, so that turns into oh, that's why it doesn't look right. Nobody stopped me. There you go. You got it. One mile is not twelve inches. And that's why 5,000, as I was entering into the calculator, I thought I should be dividing by 5,280. So 0.21330. Two one three three. Incidentally, so this is the distance that's that sound travels in in one second, right? Put into miles. Um, what is it? What was? Who uh, remembers being taught as a kid how how you could tell how far away a thunderstorm was? You look at time for lightning or thunder. Yeah, you assume the lightning gets there instantly because light travels so fast, and you count the time between when the lightning, when you see the lightning, and when you hear the thunder, right? 
I, I remember learning it as a kid that for every one second distant um, difference that that was one mile away. That's not what this says though. This says that thunder, that sound travels um, about a fifth of a mile in one second. So every, for every five seconds you count is one mile away. So not that it really makes a difference because nobody ever uses that in a life or death situation, right? You know, nobody's, nobody's out there judging how far the storm is. It's always just kind of for fun. Um, but yeah, no, it takes sound about five seconds to travel a mile, not one second. As far as finishing the rest of this problem up, I'll switch, switch colors here. If, we're, if this is the time for one second, and I want it in hours, we can take our conversion. We have a straightforward conversion seconds to hours. It's 3,600 seconds is one hour. Or if you don't have that memorized, go seconds to minutes, 60 seconds to minute, and then 60 minutes to an hour. And we'll get a really small number, right? Two point seven repeating times ten to the minus four. So two point seven 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 eight times ten to the four, negative four. Why did I keep all those sig figs there when I only started with one second? I kept the same number of sig figs we started here, right? When we have a combined unit, whatever's on the denominator, we actually usually assume that that's an exact number, that the measured number is in the numerator and whatever's in the denominator is exact. So you could keep all the sig figs if you wanted down here, but we're gonna wind up rounding it to five sig figs at the end anyway. So I wrote five sig figs here. So best practice is assume the same number of sig figs on top and bottom for a combined unit. If you've got three sig figs on the top, assume three sig figs on the bottom. All right, so then, Last step here to get it in miles per hour. We have the distance that it travels in one second. We have one second written as hours. We're just going to take miles and divide by hours. And that should give us 767. Or at least something close to it within sig figs. 0 0.21330 miles over, and you can write it in standard notation if you wanted, or 2.7778 10 to the minus four hours. Seven sixty seven point eight seven. Point eight, yeah, eight seven miles per hour. So we're off by a little bit more than one in the last digit compared to the number um, that we saw from David earlier, where if you do it all as once with no rounding, you might get 767.90. Those are still really close to the same number, right? They're more than one off in the last digit, but they're still considered the same number within sig figs. Um, if the true number is really halfway in between those, you could be off by as much as one in either direction. So it's not. Yeah, no, David, you rounded correctly. It's just we just wind up with a slightly different number if we round our miles and round our hours and then do the division and round again. We get a very slightly different number, but it's still 767.9 ish. All right, so and we're gonna keep doing 
conversion practice at the beginning. We might not spend this much time on it every time once you guys get the hang of it. And I'll probably start turning it more into word problems since that's where most of you are that are struggling are, are fighting. Um, and I'll try to keep it relevant to what we covered last class. So we're reviewing last class at the same time we're practicing our conversions, but we'll keep working on this. And we should get to the point where stuff like these four conversions are second nature. And realistically, I'm looking at these, these right here, other than the fact that there's two length conversions, um, this is almost exactly what the conversion section on the test is going to look like. There's going to be one straightforward length conversion. There's going to be one that involves having to either square, square a unit or cube a, a conversion. There's going to be one that asks you to, com to convert a combined unit. And then there's going to be one that's something else, probably a temperature conversion, if I'm remembering properly. Right. But it's going to be this. This is how we're going to break up the conversions on the timed portion of the test. Um, and just, just to set everybody at ease a little bit on that, and because I want you to see it and start getting used to it, um, let me share screen and I'll pull up last year's test and you can see what I'm talking about. Again, we will continue to Um, we will continue to practice this and we'll go over this in more detail when we get to the um, closer to the final. But the way the test is going to work is that there's going to be um, there's going to be a, an explanation section that asks you to explain some concepts. There's going to be a sig fig question where I ask you to actually pay attention to your sig figs. I'm going to grade you kind of harsh on sig figs. But the conversion part is going to look just like that last slide we did. In fact, look at that, 343.2 meters per second into miles per hour. It's even got the exact same problem we just did, right? Um, it's all it's going to be made up of four things. And you know, there's an easy one, a kind of tricky temperature one, one that involves cubing units, and one that involves a combined unit. Right. So there, the only place you will see a word problem on the timed test is going to be that wild card section at the end, which is going to always look something like a word problem. And I'm going to give you some random pieces of information and ask you to calculate something. It might have to do with lead, lead batteries. It might have to do with temperature change and energy. It might have to do with electrons. Um, it changes year to year. But so just because you're stumped on the word problems right now, doesn't mean you're not going to do well in this class, right? Everybody's struggling with those right now. All right. Um, we did not go over the lab from last week yet for part. Um, this was the burette problem. Um, I put it on here. I think you guys are actually in a pretty good place with this as a whole. Um, this was problem. What, problem two on the pre-lab that you guys were working on last week. Um, and if you did it right, you should come up with a density around 0 0.9, 0 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter. If you didn't get an answer around 0 0.9, you probably either forgot to subtract the mass of the empty beaker, or you didn't realize that burettes measure a difference in, in volume. A burette is basically a graduated cylinder with a valve at the bottom. And you make take a reading of where it starts, and then you add some liquid to a, a vessel, and then you take a reading where it ends. So your actual volume would have been the 9.62 minus the point, place where it started, the 1.52. Right, so on in terms of of what it would actually look like in a lab. You would see something like, I'll draw the, the big picture of a burette. Big picture of a burette is just a long glass tube with a valve at the bottom. 
Um, and so you can put a Erlenmeyer flask down here and that, and you can add a very specific amount of liquid from this burette into the, your whatever vessel you're using down here, right? And so when they say that you took, you filled it up and then you measured that it started at 1.52, if we zoom in up here, that just means that you've got our starting point is at 1.52 milliliters. And then we drain the liquid out of it until we got to a marking of 9.62 milliliters. <clears throat> so the actual volume that we wound up measuring is not 9.62, it's 9.62 minus 1.52. We're always with this piece of glassware, you're always gonna measure a difference. Where did you start? Where did you end? Right, and so your number might've been a little off if you just use the 9.62 and that's why it gave you all those numbers. You needed to know the 1.52 because that's where it started and this is where it ended. Um, this is one of those where once you see one of these in a lab, it's a lot easier to make sense of what they were actually telling you to do, not having seen it in, in lab. Um, you may not, might not have known what was happening here. But... All right. So then, and then the total mass of the vodka would have been 0.5. the vodka with the beaker minus the empty beaker. I think that you guys are, can all wrap your heads around. This is called um, measuring by difference, where you weigh something that's empty, and then you weigh it full, and you use the difference to figure out how much you added. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, so I think that, that uh, I don't think you guys had too much trouble with that, but um, I did see a few people having issues with it and trying to, to use 21 as your total mass. All right, any questions on any of the review stuff we've done so far? Um, I believe the answer yes should be around 0.9. I can do it real quick. Uh, 21.123 minus 13.687 over 9.62 minus 1.52. Yeah, point, point 0.918. Um, I knew it was going to be around. And this is just because if you pay attention long enough, you start to memorize things. I know that the density of pure ethanol is around 0.8. And I know vodka is about half pure ethanol. So it should be somewhere between the density of water, which is one, and the density of ethanol, which is 0.8. And it got us pretty close. Ethanol is actually really funny to me because it's density. To, suit to two sig figs is the same as its boiling point to two sig figs. They're both 78 Celsius and 0.78 grams per milliliter. So that's always seemed odd to me. So I've always been able to remember those two numbers. All right, we ended off talking about temperature and as a form of kinetic energy. And we then we did some conversions with temperature. Actually, you know what? It's 220 right now. Let's go ahead and stop um, and take our 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll tackle, tackle our new material at 2.30, right?
All right, folks. So we ended up last, last class talking about kinetic energy as it applies to molecules, as it applies to individual objects as being something we can measure in the form of temperature. Thermal energy is kinetic energy. Um, and, and so it's, it's just the molecules moving um, and bumping into things. And that's what our body perceives as heat in a lot of ways. If you touch something hot, the reason it hurts is because those molecules are moving so fast that they heat, they make your own molecules and your fingers start moving much more quickly, which triggers a heat sensation and sends heat, um, a pain, pain signal to your brain. Um, but there's also a, a equivalent of potential energy at the molecular level. It's just not in the form of gravity. Potential energy at the scale of molecules is based around chemical bonds and how stable electrons are. So the potential energy that we see um, a lot of times in, in chemicals is um, we see it what are referred to as high energy bonds being broken down and turned into lower energy bonds. And that excess energy, as those, as those bonds go from high energy to low energy, that excess energy is released in the form of light or heat. So it just like starting with a bowling ball at the top of a hill, as it rolls down the hill, it's turning potential energy in the form of, of height into kinetic energy in the form of how fast it's moving that's really equivalent to what molecules do. Molecules that have a lot of potential energy are, it's like starting at the top of a hill. And as you let, let it go down in, in energy, that potential energy is turned into kinetic energy, almost always in the form of heat or light. All right, and so we can use that to actually do work as well. So remember our original, definition of energy was the capacity to do work, the capacity to, to change other objects' velocity. Um, and so we can think about that in the terms of use burning fuel to make cars move. Um, you can also think about it just in the, in the context of making other molecules move faster. Increasing the temperature around is giving kinetic energy to the surroundings, is doing work. It's not necessarily usable work in the, in the engineering sense. You can't use the surroundings get hotter necessarily as a way to make a car move. Um, so a lot of that's referred to um, as the heat tax. Uh, if you lose energy in the form of heat when you burn a fuel, that's energy that you're not gonna get back. That's kind of what limits efficiency of certain, of certain devices, including uh, internal combustion engines. Um, and motors for that matter, electrical motors still have a heat tax. Um, if you've ever you know, been talking on your phone for an extended period of time, and then when you go to set it down, you notice how hot your phone is, that heat is electrical energy that's been lost as heat um, that's not going to powering your phone. Um, and so this is mainly just so that we can think about the energy both as and at the molecular level still in terms of kinetic energy and potential energy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how chemists view energy since we don't typically calculate work um, in chemistry. If you get into engineering or if you take physical chemistry, which is an upper division chemistry class where it's kind of where physics and chemistry meet, um, then you might start to have to calculate work. Um, but for the most part, in chemistry, we're going to talk about things just in energy units. And energy units themselves are actually really fascinating. Um, the, most, the two most common in chemistry are calories and joules. Um, and they're both they're close to the same magnitude. Um, joule is the, is the standard energy unit, because it's what you get if you take one kilogram and you apply a force um, of one meter per second squared over the distance of one meter. Um, basically, it's a, it's a way of measuring work. Um, and so it has this, this 
these funky units associated with it. And that that's just comes from the derivation of what energy is in terms of physics units. Um, calories actually make a lot more sense in terms of chemistry because it's talking about a temperature change. And the, for the most part in chemistry, we're going to talk about energy transfer in the form of temperature change. Um, so a calorie's original definition was it was the amount of energy that's required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, that's not the calorie that you're used to thinking about in terms of dietary calories. Dietary calories, one gram of water is not very much. Your body is mostly made out of water, right? And so, um, so we actually deal with kilocalories. So that'd be the energy required to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. Or the flip side would be, be the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water by 1,000 degrees Celsius. Um, although we don't typically think about it like that because you can't raise one gram of water 1,000 degrees Celsius without it you know, boiling, vaporizing, and then you have other things happening as well. Um, so, and if, if you, they're very clever about how, how they write calories, dietary calories, um, they actually make use of that capitalization that everybody forgets to pay attention to that we talked about on Monday, right? Um, a, if you look at your nutritional facts on, on, any, um, on any food, um, it's capital C calorie. Capital C calorie is a kilocalorie. So it's a thousand of the regular calorie. Um, and I don't know why they didn't just use the prefix in America, because if you go to Europe or if you go to Mexico, it's usually written as kcal for kilocalories. Um, so the only thing I can think of is because Americans seem to be pathologically allergic to the metric system, they didn't want to put kilo in front of any unit that Americans had to use, so they just made it a capital C instead. Um, but that's really what it is. It's a kilocalorie. Um, so you'll frequently hear people refer to kcals if you're in the if you're in nutrition or if you're in um, in uh, upper division science classes you'll hear kcals or kilojoules um, which are abbreviated kj um, and then there's lots of other units that are kind of specific to different disciplines if you go into mechanical engineering um, you still they still um, rate furnaces for instance in BTUs. Um, BTU stands for British Thermal Units, uh, and so if you buy a, a furnace, it's probably rated in BTUs per hour, which is how much energy it can put out to heat a house. Um, lowercase e with a capital V is called an electron volt, and an electron volt is the energy that you get from dropping one electron from a high energy state to a state that's one volt lower, which doesn't make any sense and it's an exceptionally tiny amount of energy it's only really used in physics and electrical engineering occasionally um therms is actually how they sell natural gas they sell natural gas and in, in 100 cubic foot increments and that's for when it's under a certain amount of pressure and so therms is actually a energy unit that is directly defined as the amount of energy you get from burning 100 cubic feet of natural gas. Um, kilowatt hours, we've all seen that. If you've paid a, a utility bill in your lifetime, you know you might not know what it is, but you've seen kilowatt hours. Um, these last two are very interesting. These are also energy units, barrel of oil equivalents. A barrel of oil equivalent is the amount of energy that you get from burning 55 gallons of crude oil. Um, so it's it's uh, you can turn that in. That's how you get things like America uses a um, hundred million barrels of oil a year. So they estimate how much distance Americans drive and how much America energy Americans use to heat their houses using petroleum products, and then they turn that into barrels of oil equivalents. Um, and then this last one's fun, tons of TNT. Tons of TNT is an energy unit. Uh, it's tons with an E, so it's actually metric tons uh, is the official number. And so they use that to rate um, explosive devices, bombs. Um, so the 
the largest bombs um, before nuclear bombs were invented during World War II, um, they would actually rate planes in terms of tons of TNT. How many, how many tons of TNT of bombs could they carry on a plane? And I believe the first, the atomic bombs that were dropped in Japan were 15 and 20 kilotons. So one bomb that had the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. So work that out backwards. That's the equivalent of 1.5 million kilograms of dynamite being detonated at the same time in the same place. So it's, it's no wonder that nuclear weapons were kind of a game changer um, and why we don't fight wars the same way we used to back in World War II. Um, and this other table is just also a really interesting way um, of looking at the, at comparing how big um, various amounts of energy are. Um, and the interesting thing about this scale that you guys might not have seen before is it's a log scale. So this scale is going in powers of 10. Every white line is a thousand times greater than the white line before it. So the energy needed to sleep one hour is 10 to the fifth joules. Energy um, needed to bicycle for an hour is 10 times greater. You need about 10 to the sixth joules, or about a, about a, a million joules, um, which would correspond to about 250 calories, uh, 250 kcals, 250,000 calories. Um, energy use, energy from one gallon of gasoline is 10 to the eight joules, which is energy per person per year in the US is a thousand times greater than that. So the average person in the US uses enough energy, enough electrical energy um, to be the equivalent of burning a um, thousand gallons of gas a year. Um, so that's taking into account your car, that's taking into account your electricity use, that's taking into account probably your food as well. Um, but then look at this big jump. There's a 10 to the six difference. There's a million fold different difference to get up to solar energy reaching the earth per second. And it's only a 10 to the three difference. It's a thousand times greater. Total energy consumption for one year in the US is 10 to the 20 joules. That's only a thousand times greater than the solar energy that reaches the earth per second. So in a thousand seconds, enough energy reaches the, the world, which in a thousand seconds is less than an hour, right? Our 3,600 seconds is one hour conversion. So in about 20 minutes, enough energy reaches the earth to, to be the equivalent of the total energy consumption for the US for a year, which is kind of crazy. Of course, not all of that's usable, energy, even if we covered every single square inch of the planet in solar panels, not all of that could actually be turned into electricity based on how solar panels work. Um, but it's, it's still kind of a staggering amount of energy that's per second. It's one of the reasons why solar is such, has such promise as a renewable energy source, because there's, there's a lot of energy in solar. Um, World, and I have no idea how out of date this figure is at this point. Um, we probably have not made that much change in world reserves of fossil fuel, um, about 10 to the 23rd, which is about a million times here to take a million seconds, which again is less than it is going to be a thousand times 20 minutes, so 20,000 minutes um, to equal the total world reserves of fossil fuel. Um, and then this is, this is also kind of fun to think about from a sci-fi perspective. Energy radiated by the sun per second is a thousand times greater than that. Um, so it's, this actually led a, uh, a physicist slash engineer from the 60s whose name was Dyson, um, actually postulated that well, if almost all of the energy from the sun is being just released out into the universe and not being used, um, a, an advanced enough species 
would actually use all of the uh, material around it and actually enclose their entire sun in a shell so that none of that extra energy was being released. They call that a Dyson sphere, um, which is kind of an interesting thought experiment. Then you really don't have any issues with, uh, with running out of land or, um, or solar energy, right? There's plenty of land and solar energy for everybody at that point. Anyway. As far as use, useful things that you actually are going to have to know for this class, instead of just me randomly talking about energy. Um, as I mentioned before, most of the how, way we're going to measure energy is going to be in the form of changing um, energy. And so the change in energy is typically measured in terms of looking at the difference in temperature before and after a te um, something before energy changes hands. So something with a lot of energy bumps into something with not very much energy, you transfer energy to it and you have a temperature change that corresponds to that. Right, because remember temperature is, is a measure of how much kinetic energy these molecules have. So specific heat is a property that's kind of like density. It's a little bit trickier to wrap your head around because it's a measure of the amount of energy that raises one gram of a substance by one degree. So to take energy and raise something's temperature, you need to know, um, you need to know both what the substance is and how much of it you have. Because water, one gram of water is gonna take less energy to heat it up than if you have a whole pot of water, right? So mass plays a role in this more material you have, the more energy it takes to change the temperature. And what the, what the material is plays a role. Some things heat up faster than others. Water actually has a particularly high specific heat compared to most metals, which is why it's uh, an empty pot on the stove heats up so much faster than a pot with water. And because the specific heat of metals is lower than the specific heat of water. So it takes fewer calories to heat up a metal than it does to heat up water. Um, sometimes you, and I, I frequently will slip up and use the term heat capacity. Heat capacity is related to specific heat. Um, it's not as technically correct. We won't get into the difference in this class between specific heat and heat capacity. So. Um, if I say heat capacity, you can kind of treat it interchangeably. Um, I'll try to stick to using specific heat, but it's, uh, it's an old habit. Um, and what this really is going to allow us to do, though, is it's going to allow us to calculate amount of energy based on a temperature change or calculate a temperature change based on an amount of energy. So the way this works is it uses, this is going to be our, our fundamental equation that we are going to use for uh, anything involving temperature change. If you see a temperature change in a problem, you're probably going to use this equation in some form. Right? And so what this all stands for is the Q is, um, is actually heat. And heat in this in does not just mean how hot something is in the sciences heat actually specifically means a transfer of energy transfer of thermal energy so it's not we we've never talked about how much heat something has heat is by definition a change in energy so instead we'll talk about things like the heat of vaporization is the amount of energy that it takes to boil something and the heat of condensation is the amount of energy that's given off when a, when a gas condenses to a liquid. Lowercase m, we've seen that before, is mass. The Cp term, that's our specific heat. This is the other, I don't know why they didn't use a, a less confusing term. Q is heat and CP is specific heat. Um, I don't know why we don't have a better way of differentiating, but you're gonna have to be very, very careful 
in telling specific heat versus heat, right? That's something you're gonna have to pay attention to because it's easy to get those mixed up. Specific heat's always gonna have these complicated units though, and heat is just gonna be an energy units. So calories or joules. Should we then it, just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could we just think of it as the Q as energy or would that be a difference? in the terminology so so the answer is depends on how how much i want to split hairs um the it would not be good to just call q energy because energy usually gets used in a more broad sense energy as a whole usually can includes heat and it includes other terms as well um so it'd be a it's better to think of Q as heat because Q specifically has to do with change in temperature. And energy can involve a lot of other things as well. But that's a good question. I had never, I had not considered that. And I think that's one of the reasons that I keep defaulting to using the term heat capacity, because that kind of differentiates you about heat and heat capacity. Specific heat um, is the better word for CP. Um, but it kind of heat capacity kind of gives you a hint of what it's actually telling you is how much energy to raise the temperature. And so with when we plug in all of these, this delta T is considered one term. And that's so the delta means change in and capital T is temperature. And so we'll, we'll frequently use delta all, uh, a lot in, in chemistry to, we'll just put delta in front of any um, specific variable that we're talking about and that just change in that variable. Um, and the more accurately, it's anytime you see delta or change, it's always going to be final minus initial. All right, so just to make sure that you get your negative signs in the right spot, you always want to make sure that for any change, it's whatever you end with minus what you started with. So if your temperature went down, if T final is lower than T initial, your delta T would be negative, which makes sense, right? If your temperature dropped, your change in temperature was negative. And that would be reflected in plugging your TF and your TI in the right spots. And just as a, as a, I don't know, a hint or a heads up, take your pick. Um, there is at least one of the problems on the homework this week where you have to solve for TF. So you can't actually solve for Delta T. You need to plug in TF minus TI here to find TF. And so you get a more slightly more complicated Q equation in that case, or it looks more complicated. It's not actually more complicated. It would just wind up looking like this. Q equals MC T final minus T initial. You know, if you have it written in this more complete form, it gets a little bit easier to see how the algebra might work if you were trying to solve for the final temperature after something happened. If you know everything, if you know your initial temperature and your mass and your specific heat and your and the heat that went into it, you could solve for TF. All right, so you that will happen occasionally in. Um, some of our word problems where you can't solve for delta T necessarily, you kind of, you might have to um, do a substitution where you plug TF minus TI in for delta T. All right, and so this is just a more legible version of what I chicken scratched with my mouse. And so Q is heat, 
energy transferred, M is mass, CP is specific heat, delta T is change in temperature. And if you watch your units, it will make sure that you don't mix up heat and specific heat because a specific heat is always going to have the complicated units associated with it. Uh, it also means you need to pay attention to your units for temperature as well, because if you've got delta, if you've got um, degrees Celsius in your specific heat, that means your delta T has to be in degrees Celsius. Um, if you've got grams in your denominator here, that means your mass has to be in grams. And occasionally you might see specific heats that are not in these standard units. You might see specific heats that are in um, that are in kilograms or might even be in degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, I'm not going to give you those specific heats, but they exist out there. Um, and the other thing to watch out for is a lot of times when we start dealing with reactions, we're actually going to solve for Q using conversions. And we're going to get Q in terms of kcals. If you get Q in terms of kcals, but your specific heat is in regular calories, you need to do a conversion before you can actually plug things in. You've got to take kcals and put them in regular calories before you could actually plug it into the equation, right? And the main, so the main thing, I'm, I'm not trying to say this just to like scare you. I'm just telling you, if you watch your units and make sure that all of your mass units match the mass units that are in your specific heat. Make sure all of your energy units match the energy units in your specific heat. And make sure your temperature matches the units in your specific heat. Then you're going to be fine. When you start plugging things in without converting them, you're going to start getting numbers that don't make sense. Yeah, Dana. Um, I have a question about kcals and just um, as far as converting them to calories so that we can solve the, the equation. Um, how would I convert kcals to cals? Is that something that's common knowledge or I should know? So it's something that we that um, we're going to get more familiar with it. K, K is a prefix, right? It means kilo. Mm -hmm. And so kilo is on your prefix on your equation sheet, right? Pre Under a kilo energy. something. Or under so right under look right underneath temperature it's on the page you're looking at see that box right in the middle yeah right there oh, oh okay kilo is 10 to the third power right so that means one kcal equals a thousand regular calories which okay okay just like one kilogram equals a thousand grams or one kilometer equals a thousand meters and so we'll see the same thing with, with kilojoules as well. I didn't One realize K was just a prefix. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Um, and that's anytime you wind up with a, um, you get a unit that you recognize, but with a letter in front of it, that letter in front of it is almost always going to be a prefix. Um, and that includes Greek letter. There's one Greek letter in your prefixes, right? Um, which was um, micro. So milli, lowercase m, and capital M for mega were already used up. So for micro, they actually used the, a Greek M which is, it kind of looks like a U with a tail on both sides. Or if you look at it sideways and squint, it kind of looks like a cursive M a little bit. Um, this prefix, this is the Greek letter mu. Uh, and that's the Greek, that's the prefix for micro, which would be a millionth smaller. So milli is a thousand, a thousand times smaller, micro, is a million times smaller. So micrometers, um, or are what are also called microns, is a micrometer. Um, and that's 
just so that you're aware of when you see this is a prefix that is on your sheet as well. I think it's the only one that has a Greek letter as the prefix. Um, also, for any of you who like to play Scrabble, uh, Greek, Greek letters spelled out are fair game in Scrabble. So almost all of your two letter words are Greek letters, M-U and N-U, nu, are, are uh, fair game on Scrabble. Um, and that's just to help you get to those uh, those triple triple words when when your com competition is not expecting it. All right. So a few. Let's do a practice with this. So you've seen some practice before your homework. Uh, so we've got, it's written as a word problem, but it's a pretty straightforward one. Burning one gram of table sugar gives you a certain amount of energy. In kilojoules, we will frequently see that the energy from chemical reactions is way bigger than the energy to change temperatures. So almost all of our chemical reactions are going to be in kilojoules or kcals. And so that's what I mean about watching your units. If all of the energy from burning one gram of table sugar goes into 120 grams of water. What is the temperature change of the water? And so what is the temperature change it means we're solving for delta T. We've got a specific heat given. The units don't look particularly friendly when they're written in this way. You frequently will see um, when people are trying to write units uh, or type units in, if it's complicated units, they will write to the negative one power. But when a negative exponent just means you're supposed to divide by that number, right? So this is a, a a more compact way of writing joules over grams degrees Celsius. And this takes up a lot more room on a page than, than this, and this is also a lot easier to type. So scientists being lazy um, will frequently write complicated units like this, even though they're not as user friendly. So we've got a specific heat, we've got a Q, we've got an amount of energy, we've got a mass, we wanna find the temperature change. All right, so I'm, everybody has their, the numbers written down. I'm gonna stop sh the screen share so I can go to the board here. So we were given Q in units of, of uh, kilojoules. But that's OK. We can convert kilojoules to joules. We just need to remember to do it, not forget it. So might as well do that while we're thinking about it. So one kilojoule, thousand joules. So you get 1.65 times 10 to the four joules. We're given specific heat. For water, it's always going to be the same. Well, for liquid water, it changes a little bit based on the temperature of the water, but to we can we can usually make this assumption, which is why it's on your list of common constants. 
and that's joules per gram degrees Celsius. We had two masses in that problem statement, right? It said burning one gram of table sugar. And then it says, if all the energy goes into 120 grams of water, which mass do we want to use here? There's an easy answer to that. What's changing temperature? Water. So if, we, if the water is changing temperature and we're using the specific heat of water, we need the mass of the water. So forget that one gram of sugar, that's just, that's flavor for the problem statement. It's telling you, it's setting the problem up. We don't need to use that one gram of table sugar. So now we're all good to go. We've got three out of the four variables on our equation, right? We had Q, mass, specific heat, delta T. Four variables, so we need three in order to solve for the four. One, two, three. So now we can just plug that in and get 1.65 times 10 to the 4 joules equals 120 grams times, and I ran myself out of space here. Let me rewrite that smaller. One point six five times ten to the four joules equals one hundred and twenty grams times four point one eight four joules over grams degrees Celsius times delta T. And delta T is what we're solving for. It's two letters, but it's one variable, right? The change in temperature is one variable that we're solving for. And or somebody asks, yes, it's a good idea to write all your units, even though they take up a lot of space. Because this is going to be what makes sure that you didn't forget to convert your kilojoules to joules. All right? And then it'll also help you make sure you get the right units on your answer, because you've got grams on top of, of the um, fraction line and grams on bottom. So grams is going to cancel out. We've got joules over here, and then we're going to divide by joules in a second. So joules is going to cancel out. We're going to be left in degrees Celsius, which tells us that we plugged in all the right units to begin with. So our final answer here. And you can either multiply these together and then divide both sides by what's left, or you can divide both sides by 120 and then divide by both sides by 4.184. Mathematically, it doesn't make a difference, right? That's that commutative property. It doesn't matter what order you do your multiplication and division in. And I get 32.86. And how many sig figs should we keep? Good. 32.9. Good job, Alan. Yeah. We've got three sig figs, three sig figs, four sig figs. So we're going to keep three sig figs in our final answer. Can I ask something real quick? Absolutely. I may have missed something, but how come the specific heat was 4.184? So that's going to be every substance is going to have its own specific heat. So it depends on what the substance is. If it's water, it's always going to be 
copper has its own specific heat. Iron has its own specific heat. Um, ice actually has a different specific heat than, than liquid water. So it's going to be something you either need to look up or that you ha I have to give you. Okay, thank you. Um, and in fact, one of the lab next, maybe next week's lab, um, will actually have you calculating specific heat based on a process called calorimetry, which is if you have a bunch of water like this and you measure temperature change and you know that water's got a specific heat and you know the mass of the water, you can figure out what Q is. And if you know what Q is that went into the water, you can figure out how much energy came out of something else, like a piece of hot metal, for instance. So if you dump a piece of hot metal that's at, say, 100 degrees Celsius into a bucket of water and you watch the temperature of that water, you can actually figure out the specific heat of the metal that you put in there. Which means you can actually identify the metal based on um, how much the water temperature rises when you put a hot metal in, in the water. Right, so it's actually, it's something that's used, it's one of those physical properties that's used to um, identify a substance. If I don't know what a particular metal is, but I know it's got a heat capacity, it's like 0.17 or something like that. Then I, I can look, go to a table and say, oh, 0.17 calories per gram degree Celsius, that matches aluminum. Right, so it's, it's always, but it is definitely going to be dependent on what the material is. And I'm going to have to either give that to you or um, you'll have to look it up depending on the situation. All right, let's see if there's, there's one more we're going to do today or. Um, so the second part of this is if we wanted to figure out how many kilocalories are in one gram of sugar. Well, we don't actually need any of the math we just did. That's, this is just a straightforward conversion. We burned one gram of sugar to make 16.5 kilojoules. So we can just treat this as a, as a conversion. We have a conversion for kilojoules or for joules to calories. And so we can either write it out. So the way we could write it out is 16.5 kilojoules. And for every 1,000 joules, I forgot a parentheses there. I'm going to want another one. We can convert to joules, then we have a conversion for joules to calories. And, that, and it's winds up being the same as the specific heat of water. 4.184 joules is one calorie. And then we could go to kcals. And this is worth looking at for a second because, it, oops, and I left off a unit, didn't I? 4.184 joules is one calorie. Um, this is worth looking at for a second for if for no other reason that it's really handy to realize if we go from kilojoules to kilocalories, we had to go from kilojoules to joules. So we had to multiply by a thousand and then we had to go from calories to kilocalories. So we had to then divide by a thousand, right? Anytime you've got a conversion factor, you can put the same prefix on both sides of the conversion factor without changing anything because it's basically this, the equivalent of dividing both sides by a thousand. So in or multiplying both sides by a thousand. So we could write it out like this, or you could also 
write it out as um, you can use the conversion that just says 4.184 kilojoules equals one kilocalorie. If you can say 4.184 joules equals one calorie, you can also say 4.184 kilojoules equals one kilocalorie. Right, because otherwise we're just, and, and you can show it, you can, you don't have to do it that way. If you know that you've got your joules to calories conversion, you can show the long way. Kilojoules to joules, joules to calories, calories to kilocalories. Mathematically, it's not going to make a difference. But for those of you wondering why we bother multiplying by a thousand just to divide by a thousand, we don't have to. You can use this shortcut. All right, four minutes left. And so we'll just do a couple of vocab things for now. Um, remember that I told you I don't particularly like the, the uh, dichotomy of physical versus chemical, that all of the chemical properties and physical properties are really all tied together. This is another one of those sections where I have to teach this to you so you've seen it, even though I'm then going to go on and then tell you, well, really, those physical properties are chemical properties um down the line so in terms of physical changes physical changes are a little bit easier to understand even though we can still write physical changes out as a chemical reaction um, a physical change is anytime you wind up with the same substance before and after so for instance chain phase changes if you've got ice and then you melt the ice, it's water when it was ice and it's still water when it's liquid, right? So if it didn't change chemical compounds, then it's a physical change. Another example is a change in physical form. For instance, this is showing this is a 100 gram tablet of gold. Um, you can actually take gold. It's um, one of the most malleable metals, meaning malleable actually comes from the Latin um, malus, which means hammer, M-A-L-L-U-S, um, L-L-E-U-S. Not that I don't think anybody's correcting my Latin spelling. Um, and it, what it literally means is malleable is that you can hammer it thin. You can actually take gold and hammer it until you make a foil out of it. Um, that would be considered a physical change because it's still gold. It's just gold foil now instead of being a gold, a gold brick. Um, and generally speaking, and this is where I, I really hesitate to say this, but one of the ways that they that people define physical changes versus chemical changes is that physical changes are easily reversed. That's that easily is a qualitative term. Right. And it's not always the case because it's not very easy to take gold foil and turn it back to a gold brick. Right. Um, it's easy enough to take liquid water and turn it back to being ice, though. Um, chemical changes are when we actually change the molecular structure or we change what the substance is. Um, so if we actually wind up with new physical properties where it's not just going from gold bar to gold gold foil but it's still just as conductive in both cases um, if you actually let an iron nail rust it doesn't have any of the same properties anymore right it's not and that's one of the reasons why we don't use aluminum wiring in houses for electrical anymore is because aluminum oxidizes really really easily and then it doesn't conduct electricity so that's an example of a chemical change um, is, is anytime we go when we, if you use the term oxidation, if you use the term reduction, if you hear, if you, um, hear the term rust, any of those are keywords that it's a chemical change. Um, anytime you have a color change, most color changes are a result of a chemical process because things have a specific color that's based on what wavelengths of light they either absorb or don't absorb. And those wavelengths of light they absorb or don't absorb, that's based on 
um, the chemical bonds. If you change the chemical bonds, you change what wavelength of light they can absorb. If you change the chemical, bo chemical bonds, that is a chemical change, kind of by definition. Um, and they tend to be very, very hard to reverse. Although again, there are some cases, the examples I'm going to give you are hard to reverse, but there are some chemical processes that are easy to reverse. Um, for instance, cooking is almost always a chemical process. Um, just warming something up, though, is not necessarily. For instance, if you make a creme brulee, or is this is a panna cotta, I don't know. I'm not up on my pastry. Um, this, you can't take this and turn it back into a raw custard, right? Once you've cooked it, it's cooked. You can't uncook an egg. Right, so those are chemical processes. Um, if you just heated something up, though, if you went from, you know, a can of soup in your pantry to a can of soup that's warmed up on the stove, that's probably not a chemical process. That's a physical process, just a temperature change. And you could take it, put, cool it down to room temperature, and it's exactly the same as it was when you pulled it out of the pantry. All right, we will end there for now. We'll pick up with energy of phase changes on Monday. So if you have lab with me today, feel free to jump in there. Or if you had lab on Monday, feel free to jump in there and ask questions. It's all we're doing this week is working on that phase change labster simulation. And then next week, we'll get to actually doing some math with some phase change and some energy stuff. And so, um, go ahead and stop there.